Today at the National Press Club, the Shadow Attorney General and Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians, Julian Lisa. As the nation prepares for a referendum on an Indigenous voice to Parliament later this year, Mr Lisa will speak on the challenges ahead on the path to that vote. Julian Lisa with today's National Press Club Address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club here in Canberra for today's Westpac address. My name is Anna Henderson. I'm the Chief Political Correspondent for SBS and a board member here at the club. Our guest today is Julian Lisa MP, the Shadow Attorney General and the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians with his address entitled The Voice and the Road Ahead. I just wanted to start today though with a, a quick comment about the passing of an absolute giant of Indigenous Affairs, Yunupingu. Uh, today, I want to read some very brief remarks from his family to start our address, and then we'll just take a moment to pause before we continue on. Today, we mourn with deep love and great sadness the passing of the dearly loved father, Yunupingu, the holder of the sacred fire, the leader of the Gumach clan, and the pathmaker to their future. The loss to their family and community is profound, they are hurting, but they honour him and remember with love everything he has done for them. They remember his fierce leadership and total strength for the Yolnu and for Aboriginal people throughout Australia. He lived by his laws always. Just take a moment. Thank you. Julian Lisa has a long involvement in constitutional issues, including as a delegate to the 1998 Constitutional Convention and a co-founder of Uphold and Recognise, which is committed to upholding the Constitution and the substantive recognition of Indigenous Australians. Later this year, Australians will be asked to vote on a referendum enshrining an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in the Constitution. Julian Lisa will speak on the role that local and regional voices can play in improving Indigenous education, health, housing and nutrition, safety and economic advancement, as well as the challenges that remain on the path to the referendum. You can follow the conversation on Twitter at Press Club Ost or hashtag NPC. Please welcome Julian Lisa. Well, thank you very much, Anna. Let me acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and pay respects to traditional owners past and present and acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues, Senator Karen Little and Keith Wallahan, both members of the important parliamentary joint select committee. We gather on a day for Australians which is particularly sad for all Australians, but particularly Indigenous Australians. Unipingu was one of the greatest Indigenous leaders that modern Australia has produced. The leader of the Gumach, an Australian of the Year, a long-term chairman of the Northern Land Council, Unipingu was a man of strength, conviction and determination. A true moral voice in our country who, I'm ha who I had the privilege of meeting on two occasions. He spoke at this podium in 1977. He did what few could do. He fought and he built. He fought for rights, for freedoms and for respect and he worked in partnership to deliver land, education, jobs and opportunity. We remember Unipingu today. We mourn Unipingu today. May his memory be a blessing. Like many Australians, I didn't grow up with Aboriginal people. I remember there being one or two Aboriginal people at school and some Aboriginal students at university. But I didn't get to know Aboriginal people or much about Aboriginal culture. As a child of the 1980s and 1990s, at school we were taught about hunter-gatherer societies. But the public consciousness was not then what it is today. When I go to schools and talk to people in my electorate, I know there's a hunger to know much more about the culture and traditions of Aboriginal people of our area. In my case, the Darug and Garingai. And that's a good thing. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their culture is unique to our land. Their traditions, their stories are Australia's traditions and Australia's stories, and we should all do more to know more of them. I remember my first visit to a remote community. It was 2004 and I was 28. I was an advisor to the then Attorney General, Philip Ruddick. I travelled with him to Aracoon. Aracoon in Cape York faces the Gulf of Carpentaria. It's a beautiful tropical paradise with crystal blue waters 
and it has the sort of natural beaches that tourists in other countries dream about when they think of Australia. We went for an historic day, the ceremonial sitting of the Federal Court to deliver the final determination in the Wick case before Justice Cooper. The ceremonial sitting was held on a basketball court. It was a typical, humid, tropical afternoon. I remember meeting Gladys Timping Bunker, who famously danced in front of the High Court after the Wick decision. She was much frailer then, but that proud day was the culmination of a long journey for her. I can still see and feel the optimism and the joy. All the local Aboriginal children had been gathered to hear the pronouncement of the court that historic day. I can still remember their smiles. They seemed to radiate hope and unbridled opportunity. On that day in Arakoon, there was a belief that things would be different in Australia, that this country's Indigenous heritage and its British foundation could be fused into something stronger. Two decades on, Arakoon is still a beautiful location, but notwithstanding the work of so many, it's sadly today more notable for its violence and dysfunction. I've often thought of that day in Arakoon, and I've wondered what's become of those children who would be adults now, whose faces I saw that day late in 2004. Have they lived up to the potential of that day, or have they been caught in the cycle of violence, disadvantage and social problems, which, all, which besets all too many of our remote communities? As a non-Indigenous Australian, I've been on a journey seeking to understand Indigenous perspectives on the issue of constitutional recognition. I came to the debate on constitutional recognition from my deep interest in constitutional history and constitutional law. In my maiden speech to Parliament, I spoke of asking my parents for a copy of Australia's constitution for my 10th birthday, <laughs> definitely earning me the moniker Nerdus Maximus. <laughs> I've been involved in constitutional battles past, most notably the 1998 Constitutional Convention and as a member of the official No Case Committee during the Republic referendum. We have a constitution that is the envy of the world. The constitution's the invisible pillar that holds our great national uh, endeavour together. A document devoid of poetic or symbolic language, it's a practical, clear and concise enough document to fit in your pocket. And yet it was developed over a decade of negotiation and detailed debate and compromise. Our constitution has stood the, st the test of time. It is sadly an under-celebrated achievement that we are one of the oldest continuous democracies in the world. While the framers of our constitution were not perfect, they got a lot of things right. My interest in constitutional recognition was piqued in 2014 by the decision of the then Prime Minister Tony Abbott when he was elected to office to put constitutional recognition back on the agenda. I had concerns about his approach because I don't believe the constitution is a place for symbolic and historic language. I believe there are legal risks in using such language. And so my friend Damien Freeman and I began the work on an idea which we could recognise the place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in our national life without the need for a constitutional amendment. The result was our idea of a non-constitutional Australian Declaration of Recognition. That, that document could be developed by Australians, affirmed at a national plebiscite, and used in schools and parliaments across our civic, social and sporting life. It could say so much more because it wasn't tied down by the risks of judicial interpretation. At the time we were developing this idea, Noel Pearson was trying to work out a way to encourage constitutional conservatives to work with Indigenous leaders to advance constitutional recognition that both could support. We started to listen, to talk, to argue, to engage with each other to try and find common ground. Noel's proposal was for a national voice to advise on policies and laws affecting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. I support the idea of a voice because as a Liberal I believe in the dignity of the individual. I believe better policy is made when the people directly affected by the policy are consulted on that policy. As a Conservative, I believe in the principle of subsidiarity. I believe through empowering people, building institutions and shifting responsibility and decision-making closer to people and local communities, we're more likely to be successful in shifting the dial on Indigenous affairs. The result of that engagement was a package of reforms that we put to Prime Minister Abbott. The Declaration of Recognition, the rewording of the race's power in the Constitution to become an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander's power, the removal of the spent race-based provision in Section 25 of the Constitution, and a voice proposal which Noel had devised and workshopped over several months with Greg Craven, Anne Toomey, Damien Freeman and myself. Anne Toomey was the principal draftsperson for the voice body we put to Tony Abbott in 2014. Anne's drafting showed one way a voice in the Constitution could be achieved. I signed up 
because the idea of the Pearson-Toomey voice proposal was political influence, not judicial veto. In my mind, those words in 2014 were never meant to be inviolable. We put out an idea to show how it could be done. It was an idea that needed to be tested, not just by lawyers, academics and activists, but in the broader political debate, debate among the Australian people. I saw it not as the final word, but very much as voice 1.0. Since that time, Anne Toomey has devised at least two other versions of provisions to enable a voice in the Constitution to help contribute to the discussion and debate. Voice 1.0 was not the only proposal. Warren Mundine and Tim Wilson were also developing an idea for local and regional voices. Their idea was an enhancement of the original idea. It was about empowering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians in their communities right across the country, making a difference on the ground. It was for that reason, with proposals for a local and regional voice and a national body, that the Uluru Statement from the Heart speaks of voice, but not voice to parliament. I think it's very important to say something about the bipartisan nature of the proposals for constitutional recognition back in those days. When Tony Abbott came to government, he, together with opposition leader Bill Shorten, commissioned a joint select committee to examine the work of the expert panel. Later, Abbott and Shorten met together and worked towards commissioning the Referendum Council under Mark Liebler and Pat Anderson to inquire into what Aboriginal people wanted for constitutional recognition. The terms of reference for the Referendum Council expressly required it to advise both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. The Referendum Council led to the Uluru Statement from the Heart as the culmination of dialogues held with Indigenous people around the country. Following the Government's re rejection of recommendations of the Referendum Council, Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten again agreed to establish another Joint Select Committee, this time chaired by Pat Dodson and myself. Right the way through, it was a bipartisan process, with government and opposition in lockstep about the process, if not always the outcome. When Pat Dodson and I co-chaired the Parliamentary Committee inquiry into constitutional recognition in 2018, that process again was one of finding common ground. Pat and I sweated every word. We laughed, we argued, we tried to push each other towards our own positions, but we sought to find common ground. That report is the thing I'm most proud of in my time as a parliamentarian. Pat was generous with his knowledge and his time and helped educate me about the world through Indigenous eyes. That report acknowledges that there were many things we and those political constituencies we represented did not agree on, but it focused on what we could agree on. In so many places, we found that despite our differences, that our values aligned, but we had to practically deliver in a way that our various constituencies would embrace. And it wasn't just Pat that I engaged with. I travelled with Linda Burney, with Mal and McCarthy, with Warren Snowden. They were all from the other side of politics, but they were generous with their knowledge of Indigenous life and traditions, and I'll always be grateful for that. My life as a parliamentarian with a passion for Indigenous affairs is a constant journey of learning, one that's continued in more recent times, going to Alice Springs with Senator Jacinta Price and in Seduna with my friend Senator Karen Little. That Joint Select Committee recommended a process of co-design for The Voice involving Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to develop the local, regional and national elements of The Voice. And on the issue of constitutional design, we were presented with 18 different options for constitutional recognition. We didn't resolve that issue, but instead proposed that following the process of co-design, the legal form of The Voice, regulatory, legislatively and constitutionally be addressed. Both the Coalition and Labor committed to a process of co-design at the 2019 election. The re-elected Morrison government appointed a committee under Tom Calmer and Marcia Langton to under undertake the process of co-design of the local, regional and national bodies. The calmer langton report was delivered in July 2021. The report called for a response by the end of that year. And in accordance with the timetable set by calmer langton the Morrison government committed to the rollout of the local and regional bodies in December 2021 and budgeted a 32 million commitment to get the process started. Our plan was to build from the ground up. The plan was for local and regional voices first, as recommended by Calmer Langton. Local and regional voices, then a national voice. The local and regional voices were the foundation. With the insight, the life experience and the moral authority moving up to Canberra rather than down from it. That was the process that was in place until election day last year. Had we been elected in May last year, those bodies would have been well on their way. 
As well as our commitment to the rollout of local and regional bodies, we reaffirmed our commitment to constitutional recognition. And I quote, when there's broad agreement on the question and it has the best chance of success. Now, unfortunately, we lost the 2022 election and the way the debate has been conducted has changed. I recognise that the Prime Minister made a referendum on the national voice a signature policy, and he mentioned it at every campaign stop and on election night. There was nothing hidden in what he wanted to do. But the deliberative process of the past decade, engaging in debate, finding common ground, building coalitions, developing careful processes, and working across the aisle has been abandoned. It's now top down. The approach has discarded one of the guiding principles Pat Dodson and I wrote about in our report, namely, and I quote, balancing the urgency of a voice against the likelihood of a referendum success. We've seen that. The Prime Minister's set the timetable. He's chosen the wording. The Prime Minister first released words at Gama, words not tested or checked with the Attorney General's Department or the Solicitor General. He later amended those words in a letter to Peter Dutton, and then he amended it again a third time 11 days ago. Along the way, there have been media stumbles by the Prime Minister and Ministers because no one has settled the details about how the voice will work. The Prime Minister has chosen this process, or lack thereof. He's chosen not to legislate the body so consensus could be built in the Parliament and Australians could see how his national voice would work. He's chosen not to provide Australians with details. He's chosen not to answer Peter's, Peter Dutton's questions, which are being asked daily by people around the country people who share the conviction about the need to see change in the circumstances of Aboriginal people in this country, but who want to know meaningfully what the voice will do and whether it will be meaningful. And he takes offence when questions are asked about details in the parliament, in media interviews and at press conferences. He has refused to release the Solicitor General's advice, although he was happy to do so last year when it suited his political purposes. And while he's held up the Calma Langton report in the parliament, it's clear he's never been across its details. He has ignored repeated calls for a formal government response to Calma Langton. In doing so, he's shown disrespect to the 9,400 Australians who engaged with that report. He's ignored calls for a process to settle the Constitution Amendment before presenting it to Parliament. In doing so, he's ignored the 18 different versions of Constitutional Amendment presented at the 2018 Joint Select Committee and the discussion of alternatives put forward by such people as Father Frank Brennan and Louise Clegg and he's ignored the possibility of earlier proposals to reword the racist power and remove the spent race-based provisions in section 25 of the Constitution. He's failed to establish a process to properly consider the full range of constitutional options and thereby build consensus around a model to be presented to the Australian people. Even now, with his wording going to a parliamentary committee, he has said, and I quote, I would take a lot of convincing before I would support any amendment to those words. This doesn't sound like the views of a person looking to reach consensus. He says no party has a veto. He says he's prepared to go it alone and occasionally calls for bipartisanship about a process and a timetable which we have had no input into. The Prime Minister abandoned the process of Calma Langton, a process that was local and regional first and national voice second. The Prime Minister has discarded the deep bipartisan engagement that has characterised at least the last decade Neither Peter Dutton nor I have had any substantive engagement with the government on how we can achieve consensus. Now, I concede there have been calls and chats before announcements letting us know what's happened. But that's politeness. It's not engagement or partnership. Not answering Australians' questions, not releasing legal advice, not engaging with constitutional issues are not the actions of a government acting in good faith. It's tragic where we find ourselves with an idea that should be bringing us together but isn't all because of a Prime Minister who knows best and has who has abandoned process and the spirit of partnership. Peter Dutton came to this issue with an open mind. That's why he appointed me as the Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians. It wasn't an accident. Peter knew my history on this issue. Peter has asked for details from day one. I welcomed the release of the Prime Minister's words at Gama because I assumed they'd kick off a process where those would not be the only words up for consideration but no such process was forthcoming. What we've witnessed in word, in deed and actions has been a repudiation of the collaborative spirit that has marked the process since 2014. Good process builds consensus. It helps narrow the issues for debate and a referendum. But Labor is messing this up. And I'm so sad about that. I look at where we are compared to where we should be on this journey and I lament it, I truly do. 
In abandoning this approach of working to find common ground, the government has been forsaking a vital ingredient that's been instrumental in building public support and confidence, as well as developing a model that has the best chance of moving the dial on Indigenous health, education, housing, safety and economic advancement. Today I want to speak about what can be done to get this debate back on track and how we can give the idea of a voice the best chance of success. First, the government should recommit to local and regional voices and provide funding for them in, the next, in next month's budget. Local and regional has to be part of any model put forward. It's been forgotten by the government, ignored even in the voice design principles released last week. In the 2018 Joint Select Committee report, the need for local and regional voices and its strong support was our first principle. Despite the popular conception and the power given it to in 1967, the federal government is not responsible for much that happens in the lives of most Aboriginal Australians. These matters are still largely the province of the states and territories. The Commonwealth is just the ATM. The focus of the national voice is out of proportion to the responsibilities the federal government actually has. When I've gone to visit communities to talk to Aboriginal people, the problems they raise are problems in local community, not in Canberra. They talk about buses getting people to work, about tradies fixing houses when they're broken, about transport to get their kids to school and managing food security. These are local concerns, not issues of federal policy. It's not surprising that the committee Pat Dodson and I chaired find, found that the idea that had the strongest support among Indigenous people was local and regional voice bodies. Most people in communities don't care about Canberra, but they do care about the rules that affect their children's education and their ability to access services. As we said in the report, and I quote, we have listened closely to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Discussion has highlighted that the majority of day-to-day -day challenges facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples do not fall within the ambit of the national parliament. Many of the solutions to these challenges are at the local and regional level. I believe that the most powerful place where the voice can make a difference is in local and regional communities, because that's where we're failing Indigenous Australians. And when I say we, I mean all of us, all sides of politics. On significant measures, we're failing the next generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. There are green shoots and modest improvements, but too many of the socio-economic outcomes from the most recent Commonwealth Closing the Gap report, we hear a sorry story. Life expectancy, not on track. Early childhood development not milestones, not on track. Housing, not where it needs to be. Violence against Indigenous women and children, too high. Adult incarceration targets, failing. Deaths by suicide, failing. And of course, in terms of community safety in remote areas, we know that in too many places, it's going from bad to worse. But all of this starts on the local level. Attuned childcare services, schools that are working and services to ensure children can get to them. <coughs> Training, apprenticeship and university pathways, employment opportunities and incentives to engage in the workforce, prenatal and postnatal support services, mental health support, the availability of doctors and health workers, housing and food security and economic investments to give communities a future. You've got to get into the weeds on this and empowered local voices is where it will be done. Local voices are a vital part of changing our trajectory on all these issues. That's why I want Australians to hear the voices of communities in Alice Springs, in Seduna, in Arakoon, in Leonora, Laverton, Arnhem Land, Palm Island, and in so many places where these communities are dealing with complex, interconnected and very practical issues. In Laverton and Leonora, a local voice means ensuring children get fed. In Alice Springs, a local voice means putting the pressure on territory authorities so that the scourge of alcohol is tackled. In Arakoon and Seduna, a local voice will argue for police justice and justice support so that the streets are safe. In Palm Island, a local voice means teachers and school investments so that children get the schooling that will give them the best chance in life. As importantly, I want local mayors, school principals, local MPs, local police chiefs and community leaders to hear from local Indigenous people, to identify what services are working or not, where there are gaps and cultural misunderstandings in schooling, training or services, to empower and lift up, and importantly, to create the spaces for common ground. The truth is, a national voice that is not accountable to local and regional voices will do little to help local people at the local level. If anything, it might actually heighten disconnection and disillusionment. Let me explain. In the last year, we've witnessed the disconnect between the national debate 
driven by politicians and academics and local communities on the ground. Inner city commentators called alcohol restrictions and bans racist. Yet in Alice Springs, Catherine and Tennant Creek, it was the last safeguard protecting women from violence, children from homelessness, and communities from collapse. Even with the impassioned speeches of Senator Napa Jipper Price and Marion Scrimjaw, the Labor member for Lingiari, the calls of local communities didn't permeate into the national consciousness because the opinion makers in this town had already formed their own position. Everyone was convinced of the moral virtue of their position. Few had the humility to ask who had act the people that it actually affected. Nationally, the cashless debit card was pilloried as well. Yet I was told in Leonora, in Laverton and in Seduna about how vital the card has been in ensuring that children are fed and household budgets are spent on the essentials. The debates in our cities, and in this city in particular, are a world away from the on-the-ground realities in so many parts of this country. You see, the primary goal of a voice should be the difference it makes on the ground, not how it makes us feel on referendum night. My deep concern is that the government has quietly abandoned local and regional voices. It's focused on the voice that will have its home here in Canberra. Don't get me wrong, there is a place for a national voice. But a national voice without the local and regional voices across this country is a recipe for a body which is accountable to no one. Any national voice must be grounded in local realities, with a breadth of varied experience and new voices, not simply a larger platform for those already on the national stage. The Calma Langton report found, and I quote, that local communities want their distinct voices heard by the Australian Parliament and Government. There is a large body of evidence that shows that local empowerment leads to better outcomes in all social indicators. It also provides a clear pathway for community voices to be considered in the advice that can inform decisions made at the national level. So I'm calling on the government to re-embrace the principles of the Calma Langton Report, to allocate funding in May's budget for the establishment of the local and regional voices, to start the policy work on how to do this, and we will back it in. I accept it will not be immediate. Calma Langton said it would take three years to fully establish and bed down local and regional voices. So let's start that work now. Ideally, the local and regional voices would have been rolled out and road tested before any national voice, which was always our plan. But we are where we are, and I can't undo the government's choices at this point. But I want to be very clear. To fail on local and regional voices is to deny voices to Indigenous Australians who live outside the major capitals and it will ultimately mean no change on the issues that matter. The second area where we must get the voice back on track is in relation to the wording of the proposed constitutional amendment. In the constitution, every word, comma, and even capitals matter. There's nothing inconsequential in the constitution. The beauty and strength of our constitution is a, is a mechanical, sparse rule book for our nation. And symbolic statements made with the best intent Leave, leave room for clever lawyers to egg on activist judges to imply all sorts of things that were never intended. This matters in the Constitution because the High Court is the arbiter. The Parliament cannot amend the judgment of the Court. The Court's interpretation is final. What matters in assessing any constitutional alteration is the unintended consequences that can cascade through our system of government. To argue for changes to the government's amendment does not mean that you oppose the voice. It means you want to ensure it doesn't detract from a system of government that is world's best. I want the government to engage with two issues as they relate to the constitutional alteration. The first issue relates to the proposed clause 129.2. That clause reads, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the parliament and the executive government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We've already heard much debate about the inclusion of executive government. As a matter of principle, I believe the voice at a local, regional and national level should be engaging with decision makers. It should be contributing to policy development, warning of problems emerging and engaging in thoughtful debate. In that sense, it should be engaging with executive government because it's common sense that if you want to improve outcomes, you should have a hand in developing the policies that produce those outcomes. What is the point of such a voice if it's not delivering better outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians? It's what I first argued in the earliest days of discussion with Noel and others, and I've written about it as well. But that's not the issue here. Instead, the question is, what are the implications of putting that clause in the Constitution? The inclusion of that clause and the way it's drafted raise three immediate issues. First, who can the voice talk to? Which agencies are in and which are out when it comes to being part of the executive government? 
Second, what can it talk about? In other words, what are matters <coughs> relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples? Third, what does it mean to make representations? Does it imply or leave room for any reciprocal constitutional obligation on Parliament or the Executive? There are a few bold assertions to the contrary in the government's explanatory materials, but the, assist, but the issue hasn't been considered by any depth in any public forum. It's not enough to say that these questions will be addressed in legislation afterwards. You can't out-legislate the Constitution. I raise these issues not only at the technical level, but as a political one as well, because this clause will be the rallying point for the No campaign. For those that want the referendum to succeed, it puts the broader constitutional question at risk. The argument will be at two levels. The first is that this will create a new level of bureaucracy and there will inevitably be court challenges. The second argument about the clause relates to scope. As I've outlined above, those are questions around who the voice can talk to, what it can talk about, and what it means to make representations. These are currently all unclear. We know, for example, the Prime Minister has already started naming institutions not covered by the voice, but that's a guess. Some of his key advisers on these matters, including Professor Megan Davis and Noel Pearson, disagree. And the fact is, just about every issue touches Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in some way. I believe the clause creates doubt and uncertainty. Why allow room for a debate about whether a particular government entity is or is not part of the executive government? Why leave it to the High Court to decide what the Constitution means by make representations? If the Parliament has power to establish the voice and define its powers, why does the power to make representations need to be in the Constitution? Why not simply put that in legislation too? Now, I understand the argument of some on the referendum working group that the voice shouldn't have limits on what it may do and advocate for. The Constitution is a document of limits, checks and balances. It limits Parliament and it limits parliamentarians. It limits the judiciary. It limits the Commonwealth, the states, and the territories. They all have limits because it's a system of checks and balances. Like other institutions, the voice should operate within limits set by Parliament. As I say, I believe this clause will be at the centre of the no case, and it puts the entirety of the cause at the ballot box at risk. The constitutional alteration can work without it. The second issue is about the form of constitutional recognition. The current proposal recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in three ways. Recognition is mentioned in the long title of the bill which will form the question on the ballot paper. Quote, a proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. The second is in the heading of chapter nine itself. The heading reads, chapter nine, recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. These do not raise legal issues. Indeed, the chapter heading makes clear that every word in the subsequent section 129 recognises Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians in the Constitution. The third significant way that the government's proposal recognises Indigenous Australians is through the preambular statement, which doubles up on the recognition already achieved. This is the set of words that reads, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first people of Australia. And then the subsection sits underneath it. This type of provision is sometimes called a chapeau. It's a symbolic statement that sets out an incontrovertible fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are the first peoples of Australia. Of course, everybody agrees with the statement that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are the first peoples of Australia. But the issue with the chapeau is that it can frame the interpretation of the provision that sits underneath it, or in this context can be called in aid in relation to the interpretation of other provisions in the Constitution. And that raises questions. For instance, as I said, the government proposes to confer constitutional function of making representations to the parliament and the executive. But by putting that provision under the chapeau, would we be implying that representations can only be made if in some way they are in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as first peoples of Australia? In other words, in simple terms, what rights, privileges and obligations are implied by being recognised as first peoples? And what does that term imply at all? The Prime Minister's quoted me a lot this week, trying to imply from my earlier work that I endorse his model. But he's not quoted me on the thing that I most frequently and trenchantly have said in this debate. And that being that the Constitution is not a good place for historic or symbolic statements, however well-meaning, as those statements can have a legal effect and will be subject to judicial interpretation in ways we cannot imagine. In the ordinary course, we might refer to the debates of a constitutional convention to help clear up these types of questions. The record of those debates would help form part of our national heritage 
and will guide the High Court in the future in interpreting the new provision. But we've not had a constitutional convention. The courts won't have that archive of material to draw on. The government should engage with this issue and the others I've raised, or they risk alienating potential supporters. In conclusion, the constitutional amendment has now been presented to Parliament. There are three points of our compass that have been set. First, we support local and regional voices and call for funding of them in the budget. Second, any national voice must be deeply connected to the local and regional voices across Australia. And it would have been better had the national voice been settled by reaching a bipartisan legislative consensus before we went to a referendum. Third, the government should reconsider the wording of the alteration with a particular focus on the issues I've raised. I wish the referendum was in a better place than it currently is. I wish it was heading to a 1967 style result, but it's not. I wish the government was finding common ground and trusting Australians with all the facts. They are, they are not. They're mucking it up. My colleagues and I will keep working through the details and trying to get answers for the questions Australians are asking. We must do that because there's a new generation of boys and girls in Aracoon, in Seduna, in Palm Island, in Alice Springs and elsewhere. They need us to keep focusing on the outcomes we want from any voice. Outcomes expressed in communities of better health, education, housing, safety and economic opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. The next generation deserve their voice to be heard locally, regionally and nationally. They deserve to be given as much opportunity as any young, other young Australian to thrive and prosper. This is the common ground we must find and what all of us in public life must strive to deliver. Thank you. Thank you for that, Julian. Uh, there are any number of quotes over the last sort of five years where you have seemingly full-throatedly endorsed the idea of a representative Indigenous body to consult on the laws that the Parliament makes as a fundamental change that needs to happen. Uh, in the community at the moment, we did hear that the Aston by-election was going to be very close, the New South Wales election was still to be won by the Liberals, that the federal last election was still something that the Liberals felt was highly competitive to the end. Is there a risk that the Liberal Party is just really out of touch with what modern day Australians want? Thanks, Anna. Look, uh, the way we've participated in this debate is to ask reasonable questions that Australians are asking us about the voice. I don't resolve from the fact that I've been a long-term supporter of the idea of the voice and the principles behind it. Uh, uh, I don't resolve from the statements I've made on the public record. But the way the that the government has presented this, uh, uh, without engagement of the Australian community, without providing full details of what the national body will do, without subjecting their words to proper debate and scrutiny, without attempting to build bipartisan support um, is a real problem. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, uh, uh, my role as the Shadow Attorney General is to ask questions that Australians are asking me and to subject the proposal to proper scrutiny. Um, uh, I, I think it's important that, that we do that. Uh, in relation to the Liberal Party uh, and our position, we will uh, determine our position uh, on this after considering uh, the, the, the proposal in full. Um, I hope the Prime Minister will heed my words today. I hope that they will change course. Um, and that will be on Wednesday that that decision on, will be made? On Wednesday we are having a, a party room meeting to determine, uh, to determine our position and to determine our way forward. Okay. Cameron Gooley. Thank you. Cameron Gooley from SBS and NITV. Um, look, as Anna said, this weekend we saw a stunning loss for the Liberal Party at the Aston by-election, with the government claiming voters are sick of relentless negativity from the coalition. The last few weeks we've seen your party leader, Peter Dutton, uh, insist the Solicitor General advised against the current, uh, the current constitutional amendment wording, uh, with no evidence apart from media reporting, also noting that there has been subsequent reporting saying that that isn't correct. Uh, we've seen you and other members of your party raise consistent issues uh, over concerns of a wave of High Court litigation, concerns over whether the voice would need to be consulted uh, on RBA decisions, on foreign policy, on defence policy and so on. These concerns have been fairly strongly criticised by the government. Um, is your party conducting a campaign to actively undermine this referendum? And also at this meeting on Wednesday, given what happened in Aston, do you believe that you and your colleagues need to change how you're going about conducting this debate? 
We've come to this debate uh, with an open mind. That was Peter Dutton's position since he's been leader and he's asked for detail. Um, when the words were first released, I welcomed them and I also asked for detail. That detail has not been forthcoming. We've asked for the Solicitor General's advice to be released so the government could clarify the situation. Uh, things are where they are because the government has not released the Solicitor General's advice. They're happy to release it in relation to the multiple ministries issue. Why not release the Solicitor General's advice here? There was Solicitor General's advice provided during the Republic referendum. It should be cleared up and presented here uh, so that that particular part of the debate uh, can, can rest. Um, in relation to the Aston by-election, let, let me say this. The people of Aston have been to the polls three times in the last 10 months. Uh, they had a retiring member, and as we saw in the state election in New South Wales, the votes of retiring members don't always transfer across to, uh, to, to people. We've got a government that's still in its extended honeymoon phase, and while we've had a, a great candidate in Aston, um, a barrister, a councillor, a person from a multicultural background, uh, she, she only had five weeks to, to get known in, in the community. I think we need to take a, a lesson um, from Aston. We need to listen to what the community is saying to us and we need to uh, redouble our efforts to ensure that we as a party are connecting with the aspirations of Australians. So you don't believe that you should conduct this debate any differently to what you and other members of the shadow front bench have been doing? Well, we've been asking reasonable questions. I mean, I know there was a lot of angst about the question about the Reserve Bank. I mean, the Prime Minister could have easily uh, put that to bed in question time um, last week. That was a question that was first raised by Father Frank Brennan, a Catholic priest who's devoted his life to the betterment of Indigenous people. I don't think anybody's suggesting that he is operating uh, in this debate in other than a fair way. And if you saw the contribution of Professor Megan Davis at the weekend in The Australian, she was very clear that the Reserve Bank, that the, that the Voice can make representations to the Reserve Bank. In fact, there seemed to be little limit on where the Voice could make representations to. It's our role as the alternative government to test a proposal that is put forward by the government, particularly in the absence of other processes that I've talked about in my speech today. Rosie Lewis. Thanks, Mr Lisa. Rosie Lewis from The Australian. I'm very curious to know more about how you think the government's proposed constitutional amendment could work without the second clause. Um, I'll ask you in particular your concerns about which agencies are in and out of executive government. Is it your view it would be more palatable to the Liberal Party um, if the constitutional amendment spelt that out, for example, if it was just limited to, say, ministers of the Commonwealth? So I think the first thing to say is the genius of our constitution in, say, compared to the American constitution, is that the framers of our constitution left the decision about amending our constitution to the Australian people. The Americans leave it to their state legislatures, uh, we leave it to the Australian people, and I think that that is, that that is a good thing. Um, in relation to um, uh, th that second clause, um, I think the point I'm making is this. That there's nothing in the second clause that couldn't actually be a matter for Parliament, so that the Parliament itself could actually um, set the guide rails of which executive agencies are in and which executive agencies aren't. Um, without, if leaving that clause in as it is, you leave the matters mm. to the High Court. Similarly, you leave the question to the High Court of what are matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to which they can make representations about, and you leave the issue of you know, what does the executive agencies or the parliament have to do in order to receive those representations. There is no reason why those matters all can't be left to the parliament to determine, to provide us with the flexibility so that the voice can adapt and change over time. David Crowe. Thanks, Anna. Uh, thanks, Mr Leeser. David Crowe from the City Morning Herald and the Age of Melbourne. Uh, uh, you mentioned in your speech your long history in constitutional change, including uh, the referendum on uh, a republic. In that referendum, uh, John Howard and other members of Federal Cabinet decided that there was a free vote. There were members of Cabinet who voted for a republic. There were members of Cabinet who stuck with the, uh, the monarchy. Um, famously, of course, Peter Costello was treasurer, was a, was a Republican. Um, do you support a similar approach now where there is freedom within the coalition uh, to support the voice or to vote against the voice? Not just freedom for backbenchers, which is part of the culture of the coalition, but freedom in the shadow cabinet too, so that you make your own mind up, even if 
You may disagree with the unified position that Shadow Cabinet takes. Do you think that there's merit in taking that same approach now? I think the proposal during the Republic referendum was a good one. Um, we're going to have some discussions this week, and I don't want to preempt where those discussions will go, uh, but we'll be having discussions as a, as a party room on those matters, and I want to respect the party room enough to, to announce my position in relation to those in that place. Should we expect to know this by Wednesday, by the end of this coalition meeting on Wednesday? Uh, I think the, the, the party room will, will, uh, will look at these issues. I don't think people should assume that we will have a completely concluded position on things on, on Wednesday. I mean, we have the committee process to go and there may be some things that come out of the party room that help direct the work of the committee and our members on it. Will there be a vote? Will people get to vote? Uh, look, I don't want to preempt uh, the way that the party room discussions go. Uh, it's very rare that things come to a vote in the party room. Usually things are worked through, people have their say and a consensus position is arrived at. Tom McElroy. Thanks for taking our questions, Mr Lisa. Why advocate for the regional and local model after Labor's proposal was endorsed by voters at the election last year? Indeed, the coalition wasn't advancing its proposal in any particular haste before the election. And why back changes to the draft wording that are not supported by the working group in what is supposed to be an Indigenous-led proposal for a referendum? So I think there's a couple of things to say. Firstly, we did take the issue of the local and regional bodies to the election last year. It was part of our election policy. It was a central piece in the policy that we put out on Indigenous affairs. Uh, secondly, uh, the local, regional and national uh, elements of the voice have always been central to it. Uh, they were part of the, of the Cal Melanchthon discussion paper. And when the Labor government were, came to office, I had assumed that they would start with the Cal Melanchthon discussion paper and roll out the local and regional voices first, because if they wanted to have a national voice that works and that was in accordance with that discussion paper, and remember that process of co-design went on for two years, it engaged with 9,400 Australians around the country, many of them, most of them I assume were, were Indigenous people, it had broad support, it was the roadmap forward. What the government has done is abandon that roadmap forward and said we should go straight to a referendum. And I, I, I think that's a, that's a very sad aspect of where we're at today. Sorry, you had a second point of your question, Tom? Yes, the um, wording endorsed by the working group as opposed to a politician's proposal for change. Well, look, the, the views of the working group are, are, are important, obviously. That's the views of uh, the 20 distinguished Indigenous leaders that the government had selected to, to go through the wording. But the constitution doesn't belong to the working group and it doesn't belong to the members of parliament. It belongs to all Australians. And what we need to do before we put a referendum is ensure that, there, that there's consensus. I go back to the good sense of the policy that we took to the last election. The time to go to a referendum is when there's broad support for the, for the question and it's got the best chance of success. What we've seen on this question, and in, and in particular in polls that have been in your newspaper, is that support for this has been declining over time. I remember the Republic referendum that famously lost in every state and territory started off uh, its political journey in the referendum year with support in the 70s and 80s. This is bouncing around with support in the 50s. That is not a good sign. Uh, we have always taken the view that uh, there's no, the worst thing that could happen is to put a referendum and it fail, particularly given the sensitivity of this subject. But this is in the government's hands. This is their policy. This is their timetable. This is the Prime Minister's process. If this fails, it's a matter for him to wear. Claire Armstrong. Thank you, Mr Lisa. Claire Armstrong from News Corp Australia. You talked about the primary goal of The Voice not being about the feeling everyone has on the night of the referendum. But with this proposal, there is an element that isn't about practicality. It's been lamented what kind of Australia we would wake up to the day after an unsuccessful referendum. And in fact, despite being critical of the wording released Last month, Professor Greg Craven said, and I'm going to quote, I would vote for it because if I was forced to take a position as to the sort of advanced morality of doing justice to our Indigenous brothers and citizens, I could not vote against it. I wonder what do you think it would say about Australia and what message it would send to Indigenous Australians if the voice vote failed? And, and do you agree with Professor Craven that there is a moral impetus here to support it, regardless of your legal re reservations? Well, look, I, I think the first thing to say is that we shouldn't be putting a referendum if it's in any danger of failing. That's the first thing. The government should not be putting the country through this. 
But secondly, a referendum is about changing the constitution, and the constitution is for keeps. So we have to look carefully about, at the words that are being put into the constitution. We have to consider their legal ramifications, because the, the sugar hit that we will get on the, the night of the referendum or the day after will soon dissipate if the body is not serving the interests of Indigenous Australians and is not working in the way that it's intended. I want to see uh, a situation where um, we're only putting a question if it's, if it's guaranteed a success. I don't think we should be putting a question uh, if there's a chance for failure, and I think the Prime Minister needs to reflect on that. But what does it say? Well, I, I, as I say, there seemed to be bipartisan consensus before the last election that the worst thing that could happen was that a referendum could be put that failed. Um, now, we've got a Prime Minister who seems to have eschewed bipartisanship and said he could go it alone. Um, I think uh, this ultimately isn't about what the parties do here in Canberra. It's ultimately about what, what the Australian people do. And I think Australians should be very uh, circumspect in amending their constitution. Ken, obviously, Wyatt, Ken Wyatt says that if your party goes to the no camp, that you're going to be seen by the world as racist. Your own former colleague in Parliament. Well, I've got great respect for Ken Wyatt, but there are reasons to have pause in relation to this referendum that have nothing to do with race and everything to do with the constitutional structure of our government. And the failure of process, I'll just make this last point, the failure of process here has meant that there hasn't been enough consensus built. There hasn't been um, working on whether this is the right model to put forward to the Australian people. Andrew Previn. Mr Lisa, you've talked today about the prospect of an activist high court taking a somewhat expan uh, <coughs> expansive view of what the, the voice can do. This might be another way of expressing what Keith Wallahan said recently in that there's a fear that the High Court would interpret the amendment as an implied obligation to consult the voice. Mm. Would you support the voice if there was an extra clause added that said something on, along the lines of there is no obligation on the executive government to consult the voice? Well, look, I, I think I've, I, I've articulated a view, Andrew, that I think these matters are all ultimately left, better left to the parliament than put in the, in the constitution. I think you get the vibe of the I, I, I get the vibe of where you're going, but I also don't think we should draft the constitution at the National Press Club. I'm not asking or, you or, to, but I'm... I'm as, uh, as good clearly, a this is yes. about non-justiciability, non yeah. and this would be another way to do that. Well, there are many ways to skin the cat. I mean, uh, part of the point that I've made here is that because there hasn't been a process, people like Father Frank Brennan, who've suggested alternative ways of doing this, or the Sydney Barrister Louise Clegg, or the 18 different views of how you could do this that we, uh, that, that we got at the Joint Select Committee in 2018, have never been considered. Uh, the government has put forward this one particular view, and we're kind of mucking around at the edges here. Uh, I think the, the, that the sensible thing to do is to have a look closely at the words that are there, but to consider do we really need that particular provision in the Constitution? What's the point of, of putting the voice in the Constitution? It's threefold. Firstly, because it's what constitutional recognition now means. Secondly, it's to give some permanency. But thirdly, and this was always the point, that it would ultimately be a matter for Parliament to adjust and change what the voice did in accordance with circumstances. If we lock in these, these matters in the Constitution today, we cannot change them. That's the issue. Karen Barlow. Hello there, Karen Barlow from the Canberra Times. Uh, it sounds like a, um, a family breakdown that's heading to the courts, two sides not listening to each other, both accusing each other of mucking it up. And look, the Prime Minister's accused your side of not substantially engaging on this. Claire's asked about the, uh, the moral consequences uh, of pursuing the, the no side, but uh, my question to you is, does the Liberal Party accept the political consequences of heading down towards the no side, effectively going towards the status quo for Indigenous Australians? Well, first, I think you're making an assumption about where we're going to end up. I think the second thing to say is, look, everybody who comes to this debate wants um, things to be better for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. There is no monopoly uh, on morality here. There is no monopoly on a desire to achieve better outcomes. Um, uh, both sides of politics have spent enormous amounts of money on Indigenous affairs with little to show for it. And that's why, that, that, that's where we all come to this debate at the beginning. And the question for all Australians is whether this is the right model to achieve that end. And that's the, the, the decision that 
Parliament will face and it's ultimately the decision that Australians will face. And I got involved in this debate many years ago because I wanted to find a way that we could achieve this. And I was attracted to the idea of the voice because it wasn't symbolic, because it was something that was structural. The question is, have we got that detail and that structure right? But genuine engagement now, because a lot of people have been talking about, let's be genuine about this. Are you genuine about what you want to do right now? We've been genuine from day one. I mean, uh, you know, Peter Dutton wrote a letter to the Prime Minister in January asking a series of questions. Most of those questions have never been answered. Some of those questions were called racist. Um, I've been calling for the government to respond to uh, the Calma Langton report for months. Um, we've been calling for a proper process before the legislation was actually, before the constitutional amendment was put into the parliament. So we, so we could actually have a debate about the range of different ways that this could be achieved. We've been saying that the government has ample legislative power now, if they wanted to, to legislate for a national body, and we've called on them to do that. All of those things have been ignored. Um, the government has had tunnel vision on this, and I think that's a shame. Just picking up on what Karen was uh, asking there, what about the genuineness of the Liberal position when you were in power, when Ken White, for example, was bringing the voice to the Morrison Cabinet three times and it didn't progress? Was, was that genuine well, engagement? And I don't think that that's true. I mean, I think there's been a mischaracterisation of what happened. I obviously didn't serve in the Morrison Cabinet. But what did Ken do? He brought forward the Calma Langton report. The Calma Langton report said, roll out the local and regional voices first. What did we do? We responded. We committed to rolling out the local and regional voices and we committed the money to that process as well. I think the idea that we did nothing in government was wrong. In government, in the last term of our government, we followed the position that was set out in the 2018 Joint Select Committee report, which was to commence the process of co-design. We responded to that report and followed their roadmap. Olivia Caisley. Olivia Caisley from Sky News, thank you for your speech. Are you able to provide some more detail on why you think Peter Dutton is trying to get a united stance on The Voice and not letting MPs have a free say in supporting the government's proposal and also why the timing of this party room meeting at this Wednesday? Well, look, I can't speak to the timing of the party room meeting. Um, that's a matter ultimately for, for the leader. And I don't agree with your speculation about what, what it is that we, we're necessarily going to be doing. Uh, the party room will have its, uh, its discussion. We'll be looking at, uh, uh, at the range of different possibilities in relation to this. Now, one of the things I think the Prime Minister could do to help uh, the discussion that we'll be having is respond to the issues that I've raised today and deal seriously with the issues that I raised in relation to the amendment and in relation to the rolling out of the local and regional voices. So do you think it's still possible that the party won't reach a united stance on this? Well, look, I'm not going to speculate on what's going to happen in the party room uh, later this week. Um, uh, that's a matter for individual members coming together collectively and I respect the party room and its decision-making processes. Josh Butler. Hi, Mr Lisa. Thanks for your speech. Um, as you've noted, as you've outlined, you've been a long-time supporter of The Voice, you've been involved in all these processes, but you obviously have concerns about the current government's plans or format. Would you rather see the referendum fail than pass in a format that you don't prefer? I think the government needs to ask themselves whether there is enough support at the moment to put the referendum. That's the question they need to ask themselves. As I say, I compare this to the Republic referendum, where at this point in the cycle, the Republic was tracking at sort of 70 or 80%. Um, this is in the low 50s. Um, when I go around my community and I ask people seriously what do they think of The Voice, the thing people most often say to me is, I love the TV program. Um, and, and I don't say that with any, with any joy or sarcasm. Uh, that, is, that is the response I most often get. People don't know what this is. The idea that there's a momentum that we have to do this now, that's the Prime Minister's artificial timetable. My position on this has always been that we should take the time to get this right. But would you prefer it fail rather than pass in its current format? Well, as I said to you, I, I think it's up to the government to determine whether we should actually be putting a referendum if it's not on track for success. The government set the, the timetable. They've chosen the words. They've chosen the process. This is a matter for the Prime Minister. Katina Curtis. Thanks. Katina Curtis from the West Australian. Can I get you to clarify, is what you're proposing today that the proposed second clause of the extra chapter of section 129 
be just removed immediately, so it would effectively be Clause 1 and Clause 3 as proposed. And also you spoke about not having the archival material from a constitutional convention to rely on. The courts also rely on for interpretation um, the explanatory memorandum and the second reading speech, and both of those explicitly um, say that the, the matters that can be made representations on are matters specific to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and matters relevant to the Australian community but which affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples differently to other members of the Australian community. Is that not a tight enough definition in your view? Well, we don't enact the explanatory memorandum or the second reading speech and the court primarily looks at the words first. It does rely on the extrinsic materials and having a proper debate, as you'd get through a constitutional convention, uh, is, is the sort of high watermark of how this might be done. But what I think the explanatory memorandum reveals on matters relating to, uh, and what the Prime Minister's comments in his um, press conferences reveal, is that the government itself is uncomfortable with these words. That matters relating to, even in the mind of government ministers, is too broad. I mean, the, the Prime Minister's been talking about matters, quote unquote, directly affecting. Um, you've quoted the words from the explanatory memorandum there. That's provided a different form of words. Why are we not getting a more precise form of words in the amendment? Why does this clause need to be in the amendment in the first place? Why should these matters not be left up to Parliament so you, to spell So you out? want that second clause just got rid of completely? I, I think that the second clause is ultimately the lead in the saddle bag of a successful referendum. I think that clause and the symbolic statement at the beginning are those things which provide uh, the greatest risk of judicial interpretation that we haven't properly uh, uh, considered. And, and I think the referendum has a better chance of success without them. Just, just very briefly, uh, why not then wait for the committee process, come to the table with the government, work on an amended form of words, have that conversation? Why come to a final position on Wednesday? Well, you're assuming that we are going to come to a final position on Wednesday. I mean, we do have the committee process and... Uh, you know, obviously, we've got members of the committee here who'll be working through uh, the, the process, um, you know, exercising their own judgment. I note we have Keith Wallahan, who's a distinguished barrister of the Victorian Bar before he became a parliamentarian. We have Senator Karen Little, who has a vast life experience in government and in, and in the private sector, and also brings a perspective of having been an Indigenous Australian to these issues, as we have other members of the committee as well, like Senator Andrew Bragg, uh, and Pat Conaghan from our side, as well as government and other members. People will be bringing their, their mind to this. I think... Uh, so we shouldn't room... expect necessarily a final position on Wednesday? Well, I, I just don't want to preempt what the party room is going to do. A, it's okay. rude, and B, I just don't know what, what, what will come out of it. Uh, we have a process. I mean, part of, part of why we are where we are is that people haven't followed the ordinary processes. Angus Thompson. Mr Lisa, Angus Thompson from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. You've alluded a couple of times now to whether a referendum should even be staged if it doesn't have widespread support. Are you using your platform here and now to propose to the government to actually put off the referendum this year? And if I may, you've alluded to... Uh, well, you've been critical of adding additional layers of bureaucracy, but at the same time you're calling for uh, local and regional voices, as well as eventually a, a national voice if it's done right. Isn't that an inconsistent approach? I think the two... Let me address the two points. Firstly, it's ultimately a matter for the government whether this referendum is put or not. But why would you want to risk, given the sensitivity of these issues, given some of the questions I was asked previously, why would you want to risk uh, the uh, social and racial harmony of the country, <clears throat> the reconciliation process, by putting a, a referendum whose success was not guaranteed? I think that is a reflection that the Prime Minister needs seriously to think about. In relation to the local and regional voices, you know, they've been there from the beginning. It's what Pat Dodson and I heard when we went around the country in 2018. They were, that was the first principle that we talked about. Uh, a national voice in Canberra that is unaccountable to local and regional communities without those local and regional voices will not shift the, the needle on the ground in the way it needs to be shifted. And as I go around and visit remote communities, as I've done for most of the time I've been in the parliament um, on this issue, uh, I hear people talk about the importance of the local and regional bodies. So if we're going to change things, that's where the change has to start. Sure, but we've already got state governments uh, creating their own voices to parliament, so the horse is well and truly bolted on that front. Aren't we already creating additional layers of bureaucracy? Well, when you read the Calma Langton report, 
um, and you read the, the Dodson Lisa report, you'll see a couple of things. Firstly, we say in relation to the local and regional bodies, uh, some places have local and regional bodies that they would use as the voice already. Other places would need to create new ones. The big question that's re that remains unanswered in the Calma Langton report is how do people in local communities determine which of the existing bodies should be the voice or whether they should create a new voice? And that same question's raised about the regional voices. Calma Langton was, was silent on those, on those issues and it's one of the issues that governments would need to engage in uh, before the rollout of the local and regional. Julie Hare. Mr Lisa, Julie Hare from the Australian Financial Review. Thank you for your speech. Um, you've clearly articulated your misgivings to, uh, to the, uh, with the process to date. But if we do get to that day in October or November later this year and the voice does not get up, will you personally have feelings of schadenfreude or deep sadness? Look, I think if we have a referendum that is put, that fails, I think I will be very sad. I mean, I've been involved in this process a very long time and I just don't think it should be where it is today. Um, I think there was a very clear roadmap coming out of the Calma Langton report. It was rolling out the local and regional voices. That will help build consensus around the country for a national voice. It was working together on the national voice. It was having a process where you could uh, put a whole range of different constitutional options on the table and work, work through them before we got to this point. I'm sad today that we haven't got to that point. And that's because of the way the Prime Minister has gone about this. Thank you. And after, after spending time in a couple of different parts of Australia where there are very powerful local Indigenous community voices who want to see things like customary law given some elevation in Australia, I'm thinking in the Walpuri community, up in Arnhem Land, bilingual education in Aranda country, the request from some of those local and regional voices will be that a dis different system of justice and of law and of education exists in this country. How receptive would the Liberal Party be to those messages? Well, I think part of the nature of, of getting advice is that you weigh it up and you consider it. You don't have to adopt it holus bolus. We are still a, elected parliamentarians uh, to determine things in the national interest. But I went with Senator Price to, to a school where they teach uh, in, in Walbury language, among other things, and, uh, and I think that's good. I think the ability to to adjust policies to meet the local outcomes is so important. If you want people to learn and English is their third or fourth language, and you're actually more likely to get them to learn maths and the skills that they'll need by first teaching it in their traditional language and then teaching it in English, that's a good outcome. But that might suit one community but not suit another community. I think there's, a, there's a, an incorrect view that Aboriginal people are the same right across the country. They're not. They find themselves in different circumstances. And the beauty of the local and regional is that it allows things to adapt to the different circumstances that Aboriginal people find themselves in. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today. Please join me in thanking Julie and Lisa. Thank you very much.